It's the bean. My happy boy. Who are Titania and Oberon? Welcome to the second part of a new series where I am constructing the Feywild to be a playable realm for my characters in our D&D campaign. We are currently playing through Wild Beyond the Witchlight, but before the campaign is over, I really want to have sort of an idea of what the Feywild is and the major players in it, maybe major storylines, to start planting some seeds for a part two where we have an open world Feywild for them. So if you want a general overview of what the source books say about the Feywild, check out the first video. In this one and the rest of them, we are going to be taking specific parts of the Feywild and fleshing them out. And I'm also going to look at their cultural origins and see if there's anything else we can just add to the characters to maybe make them more dynamic. I keep saying characters, but I mean characters and places and like anything Feywild. You got it. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Titania and Oberon specifically, two of probably the most powerful Archfey in the Feywild, and therefore a pretty good starting point for branching off. They often come hand in hand, so I'll mention Oberon some when I'm talking about Titania, but I'm going to talk about her first and him second. Of course, I did this video with some research, so if you want to see where I got my information, you can check out the links below. You may know that the Feywild is a land that exists sort of parallel to the material realm, reflecting what is in it, but in a more more enhanced way. It's a land of chaos and emotion, and Titania in many ways effectively rules over it. She at least holds court over the Seely Fae. There's Seely and Unseely. Some people view the Seely as good, the Unseely is bad. I kind of like that dynamic, but technically that is not the case, and the only difference between Seely and Unseely is the rulers they follow. Besides holding court over the Seely Fae, we also know that Titania can be a patron for the warlock class. But what else? Titania is actually a character invented by Shakespeare. She is in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And fun fact, her name is actually taken from Ovid's Metamorphosis. But of course, Shakespeare did not invent the idea of a fairy queen. Oftentimes they're unnamed. There's another fairy queen who's famous in literature named Queen Mab. But in the play, Titania and Oberon are married, as they often are in literature, and their marriage is tumultuous. Basically, the play starts because they're in a custody battle over an Indian changeling boy, and we won't talk about the racial overtones of that. A changeling, by the way, is just a child put in place of a stolen child, so when the fairies take a child, they replace it with another one, that one's the changeling. Out of revenge, because Oberon wants the baby and Titania has it, he charms her and makes her fall in love with a man who has the head of a donkey, and it's all fun and games, and then by the end of the play, he switches her back and they're in love again, and I don't remember what ends up happening with the boy, but I think he tricks her into giving him custody. Super weird. In D&D tradition, she is considered to be possibly the most powerful of all the Archfey. I mean, she holds court over the Seely Fae. In fourth edition, I believe she looked like a fall Eladrin, where it says she has honey-colored skin, golden glowing eyes, and shimmering hair the color of autumn. But she can also change her appearance at will, so you could kind of just make her look however you want, whatever is like most majestic and fitting for her. She apparently has a very dry sense of humor and is quite pragmatic. Some may see her as sort of frivolous or flighty, but she is extraordinarily intelligent and capable. She is also supposed to be slow to anger, which is really nice for an archfey of that much power, but if you do anger her, then her wrath is supposed to be great. She is, and I quote, amused by mortals and had been known to take some as lovers. Ooh. As I mentioned earlier, the Feywild is a place of emotion and it's altered by strong emotion and the more powerful the being, the more powerful the sway their emotion holds. I quote, her very smile could cause crops to ripen and her frown could trigger wildfires. Her gaze could cause mortals to go mad. She's essentially a sylvan god. Apparently she is immune to paralysis and all illusions in mind affecting magics. She can recognize pure water, animals, plants, poisons. She has control over these. I think it says that she can summon woodland creatures to her aid. Very druidic stuff, plus a lot of charming powers. She's basically super beefy. I don't have a character sheet for her, but I would not recommend a low level party getting into a fight with her. She also has a palace, one that was apparently built by Oberon himself. And I read somewhere that it can move locations. I'm a little confused by how the Feywild would work on a map because it is a realm of such chaos that I guess, theoretically, that would be possible. This says that the name of the palace was Sinalese, Sinalese. I'll let you decide how that's supposed to be pronounced. 
and she holds her summer court there. The throne room was overflowing with flowers, water fountains, and fine silks, and fairies flitted all about. Mortal bards and playwrights often performed for her, and her throne was carved from ice to be in the shape of a dragon. Whimsical. And apparently it is also a magical construct that can serve as a guardian if need be. Again, a lot of this is from past versions of D&D, so update as you will. Now let's get into her relationships. We've already mentioned Oberon. They are lovers for sure. Some literature says that they are in fact married, but that does not mean they are exclusive with each other. They will take lovers freely and openly and like is said with Titania, she is entertained by mortals and may take lovers with them. And on top of being lovers, they can also be great enemies. They can feud and like we saw on A Midsummer Night's Dream, play nasty tricks on each other. And sometimes they can do both at once, love each other and hate each other deeply. There's three children that I could find named for Titania. Um, the first is Dom, the god of satyrs and Chorids, And this is actually the child of Titania and Oberon. We have Varanestra, the goddess of Dryads, uh, and she is the daughter of Titania. And then we have the Prince of Frost, the son of Titania, and I'm really excited to talk about him in later videos because I've done a little reading already and he's super cool. Siblings. There is one, but apparently it's a rumor. Last week I thought it was like solid 100%, apparently just a rumor. The Queen of Air and Darkness, the leader of the Unseelie Fae, who Titania refuses to wage war with despite Oberon encouraging her to do so. And when I get to a video where I talk about the Queen of Air and Darkness, I'll talk about what went wrong in that apparent relationship. But assuming that they are siblings, Titania will not wage war against her sister, but only grieve for her and what has become of her. In terms of other relationships, we have other Sylvan gods, AKA powerful archfey, basically, some of which are her children who consider her as queen and they will defer to her in a lot of matters of difficult judgment. That is specifically for Seelie Fae though, Unseelie Fae aren't really going to view her as their queen. But from what I've read, even if someone does not worship her or does not view her as their queen, it doesn't mean she automatically hates them or dislikes them. It seems that she still loves them and admires them, even if you know, maybe she'd prefer to have a different relationship. This sentence is written so particularly that I'm just going to read it. It says, noble Eladrin infused with the power of summer served as her barons. We also have Titania's niece, Lady Chandria, who governs over the city of starlights in the Feywild. And let's see if I can pronounce the name of that city. Astrazalian? That almost sounds like Australian. Quick overview of Titania. I'm gonna look at my notes to make sure I don't really miss anything. She was a character invented by Shakespeare for the play A Midsummer Night's Dream in which she is married to Oberon. She's a fairy queen. She can alter her appearance at will, but has traditionally looked like an Eladrin at times. And being the queen of the Seelie Fae, she of course is going to be quite intelligent. She has a dry sense of humor. She's slow to anger, but when angered, she can be quite deadly and dangerous. She's amused by mortals, takes some as lovers, may have some in her court, in her service. She has a number of impressive powers, many of them very druidic or bardic, in my opinion. And she's basically like a god with her level of power, like Archfey level 20, you know? I assume, I actually have not found like particular levels for these beings. She has a beautiful throne room created by Oberon and apparently her palace can appear in different parts of the Feywild. It's not stuck in one place. She has several Archfey children. She has a niece who apparently governs an important city in the Feywild. And she is apparently rumored to be a sister to the Queen of Air and Darkness, who she will not war against, but does seem to feel for quite deeply. Next we have Oberon. I found a little less about him. I'm assuming I'm gonna find the most about Titania out of all these Archfey, but I still found quite a bit of good stuff, so let's get into it. In medieval and Renaissance literature, Oberon is considered the king of fairies, also called the Green Lord. And he can, of course, also be a patron for warlocks according to the player's handbook. So Oberon was apparently first mentioned in a French heroic song where the hero is warned not to speak to Oberon, who resides in the forest the hero is passing through. But of course the hero does. And I thought when I was reading the summary of the story that that would go badly for the hero, like, oh, well, he was warned not to interact with this elf. But from what I understand, he actually succeeds in part of his quest because of Oberon. It doesn't seem to backfire, so I don't know. In the story, Oberon is an elf, the height of a dwarf. 
because apparently there was an evil witch who was offended at his christening and cursed him to be short like a dwarf. But because she felt bad, I guess that she then blessed him with great beauty. In D&D lore, he is not described that way. He is not described as short or dwarf-like, although I assume he's described as quite handsome. It says that he appeared as a wingless, unusually tall and muscular male fairy. Unusually tall, so totally opposite to the lore. But I also think it'd be kind of fun to have a short Oberon. His eyes were black and wild, his hair thatched and braided and run through with brambles, and his skin was comparable in color to oak wood. He was known to wear a cloak of green leaves stitched onto brown leather. Once again, kind of druidic like Titania, but like turned up a notch. He's considered the Green Lord for a reason. He resides in forest as sort of a part of nature. He's a member of the Seelie Court, also kind of worshipped as a god, specifically by the wilderness itself and animals. He is seen as a stern protector and warrior. He can also be quite wild, apparently, and is more likely to enter actual combat than other members of the court. In previous editions, he also has a lot of druidic bardic spells, as well as some ranger abilities. I actually included a link below with a character sheet someone made for him. I don't know if it's for the updated 5e version, but it would at least be a starting point if you wanted to use it. From what I read, in previous editions of D&D, there were also multiple realms that these beings existed in. I think it would be easier to just leave them in the Feywild but theoretically, Oberon and Titania would spend time other places, like the mortal realms or other realms that I don't recognize these names because I only know 5e stuff. But as I do these videos, I'm trying to sort of start piecing together potential stories. I'm just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. But I wonder if there's a situation where maybe Titania and or Oberon and or some other archfey that traveled elsewhere has become unable to return for some reason and something goes wrong because of that. I'll workshop that. Comment below if you have any ideas. Being very druidic and ranger-like, being very in tune with nature in the wilderness, he also loves to do a lot of hunting and spends more of his time out in the forest doing that than he does in the courts, which also explains why he's a bit more wild in nature and more willing to get his hands dirty. His source material actually suggested that he might be the father of all three of Titania's children, whereas Titania's source only confirmed that he was the father of one of them. I kind of like the idea of making him the father of all three though. In terms of his relationships besides that, he definitely hates the Queen of Air and Darkness and he regularly encourages Titania to go into battle and into a war with her. Although of course we know that Titania is not inclined to do that. I really like this too. It says, he was also the leader of the faction of Fae called the Green Fae which was primarily composed of wilder, more nature-oriented fae, such as satyrs, dryads, and treants, as well as some elves that dwelled in the fae wild, aka Eladrin. And other archfey of the Seelie court also answer to him, although they do put Titania above him in theory. And one more piece of information that we are told about Oberon and not told about Titania is how he became. Where did Oberon come from? And it suggests that he is actually an awakened spirit of nature in the Feywild, that he just sort of came of that. Before I wrap it up, I'm gonna give one more super fast summary of Oberon and what we generally know about him. He's considered the Green Lord or the Lord of Beast. He was also in A Midsummer Night's Dream, of course, married to Titania, and he has been in other literature besides that as an elf of the forest. And in some of that literature, he's cursed to be short, but also super sexy. And in D&D literature, he's supposed to just be an attractive dude who looks very wild. He's a member of the Seelie court, but he spends less time in the courts and more times in the wilds. He is stern, he protects the wilds, and he himself is a bit wild because of all the time he spends there. He's a bit druidic, a bit ranger-like, he loves to hunt, he's worshipped by the wilderness itself and the animals within it. And I totally skipped over a piece of information that says apparently he always went hunting for stags, but he did not kill the animals he hunted. He would basically harm them with a non-lethal weapon and then allow them to go free and continue to live. He's the consort of Titania, probably the father of her kids. He does not like the Queen of Air and Darkness and does think Titania should go into war with her. And many of the other Fae of the Seelie Court do look up to him and view him as a leader, although Titania is, of course, 
their queen. That's what I have on Titania and Oberon. Next week, I'm going to be looking into their children, basically, and exploring some of the other Archfey of the Feywild. And of course, at the end of all of this, I want to have some sort of storyline. And I know it's really early to be constructing one, but if you have any ideas that you want to throw out there or any factors that involve Titania or Oberon that you think would be cool to include in a campaign, I want to hear them. But that is all from me this week. I hope you have a great whatever it is, and I will see you next time. <laughs>